Okay, so the reason that we have Andrew Jackson there uh, shooting someone is because he was a guy who, well, tended to shoot people. He was a very interesting fellow, and uh, he was considered a Washington outsider from in the, the wild west of Tennessee. And um, his story, I think, is one that's very, very interesting. Uh, normally, I, uh, we, we watch in this class a fairly hilarious documentary that was done in the 90s. Uh, that's really, re I mean, it's got this crazy woman on there. She talks when she talks like a British about Andrew Jackson. And you're like, wow, how is this lady even on this program? But anyway, he talks quite a bit about uh, what Andrew Jackson does. Uh, he was big into dueling. In fact, when he was a young man, he escorted a woman down the Natchez uh, River. Her name was Rachel, and she had been married to someone who she theoretically thought she had divorced. Well, he, she and Andrew Jackson kind of hit it off pretty good. And then Andrew Jackson... Uh, ends up marrying her. Well, all seems fine and good. Of course, he's married a divorced woman. Um, and in those days, that was kind of like shocking. Today, of course, there's not really any, any uh, social stipulations with that. But back in those days, it was kind of a big. Uh, and then it got even more difficult. You see, Andrew Jackson's wife, Rachel, uh, her husband ended up suing her for divorce. Whoops, she hadn't actually been divorced on account of she was a bigamist. You guys know what bigamy is? You're not allowed legally to marry more than one person. You can only marry one person at a time. And here she was married to two, Andrew Jackson and her first husband. And so uh, this is a scandal. The divorce takes place and Andrew Jackson immediately remarries her. And he stays very devoted to his beloved wife for the rest of her life. And He actually uh, goes on to become president right after she dies. However, this makes him very protective of her reputation. So anytime someone comes along and is like, and then there's Andrew Jackson's wife, or is she? Oh, Andrew Jackson would fly off the handle and almost always challenge the guy to a duel. Uh, and so he fought multiple duels. Thus, we have the, the image on your screen. Um, anybody else just care to discuss politics? Well, usually it started with an insult towards his wife. And I mean, there's funny stories. There's a there's a funny story of a guy who, who uh, insulted Andrew Jackson and his wife and in a uh, crowded square. They both pull out their pistols. In Knoxville, they start shooting at each other, and bystanders get grazed by bullets. And, and then he challenges the guy to a duel, and they go out there to fight the duel. And the guy's horse runs off with a, you know, with a pistol in, in one of the saddlebags. So Andrew Jackson's got the only gun, so he's still trying to shoot the guy. Um, yeah, kind of an interesting, uh, crazy guy. Uh, and ultimately, he doesn't shoot that guy, but there's another guy who insults Rachel Jackson. And I think his name was Robinson, but I could be wrong on the name. It doesn't really matter a whole bunch. And this guy was a great shot. You guys might uh, be familiar with the fact that uh, pistols back in those days were not rifled in any way. They were not, they had no gro grooves in them. And so uh, they were like these little musket, um, little musket pistols. And how accurate are they? They're not very accurate at all. And so uh, this guy was apparently so good that at 25 paces, he could put uh, a, a musket ball with a pistol through a silver dollar. Andrew Jackson challenged him to a duel. And of course, uh, that guy, because he got he gets the first shot. And it's not like in the Old West where it's like, you take your paces, turn around, and you both draw, and whoever's fastest wins, right? That's not how it works. Uh, you take turns shooting at each other in a good old-fashioned duel. And so this guy gets the first shot, and Andrew Jackson stands there. The guy aims right at, Andrew's, at Andrew Jackson's chest and squeezes the trigger, and a whole bunch of smoke or a dust uh, goes off from Jackson's chest, and he just stands there. He doesn't fall down. And the last word to this guy is, good God, I must have hit him. And yet there he stood. Andrew Jackson cheats in this duel, by the way. You see, Andrew Jackson has the next shot. He squeezes the trigger, but it clicks and it's a misfire. He pulls it back, redoes it, shoots and kills the guy right there, dead on the ground. Uh, and so, um, yeah, there you go. There, there's, your, there's your image. Other kind of hilarious situation, there's a guy named Thomas Hart Benton, who uh, was in Tennessee politics, challenges Andrew Jackson to a duel. 
Uh, he ends up shooting Andrew Jackson in the elbow. The first shot lands right next to, in the, in the other duel that shot Jackson in the chest, it bounced off a rib and went through his insides and, and, and landed right next to his spinal column. And that was so close to a spinal column that the doctors were afraid at the time to operate because it was going to probably paralyze him. So he lived the rest of his life with a bullet stuck right up next against his, his spinal column. And it caused lots of bleeding and, and pain and whatnot there for the rest of his life. And, and Thomas Hart Benton, for whom Benton County was named, by the way. So if you live in Benton County named after Thomas Hart Benton, he shot Andrew Jackson in the elbow. And Andrew Jackson had that bullet in his elbow for 20 years while he was president. A doctor removed it, and many people said you should give the bullet back to the rightful owner. Thomas Hart Benton deserves to have his bullet back. And then Thomas Hart Benton, who by that time was a senator from Tennessee and a great friend of Andrew Jackson, now, you know, they used to shoot at each other, now they're, now they're political allies. He says, oh, 20 years possession makes the bullet Andrew Jackson's. He can keep the bullet. And so, yeah, can you imagine having a president that wild? Yeah, he did other crazy stuff in his life. Uh, when he was a, a young man, uh, he took um, two, lo he, he invited two local prostitutes to the town Christmas banquet, <laughs> which was like, what? <laughs> At the church. And so, I mean, people were just like completely shocked by this. Like, who is this guy? Um, but he was a, a pretty intense uh, lawyer. He gets rich and then he eventually goes to Congress as Tennessee's uh, representative. Uh, when George Washington was, uh, he was, he was uh, leaving office and Adams was becoming president, he ends up going to first Philadelphia and then Washington, and later, of course, you get the Battle of New Orleans and, and so on and so forth. So uh, the era of Jackson, it's called the Jacksonian era by historians because Andrew Jackson really challenged the establishment. He challenged the elites. He was very much a person whom the common man loved and appreciated. Andrew Jackson is going to expand um, political participation. And I, you know, I, I don't wanna bring any commentary. It looks like the, the era of Trump, and I do think we'll actually be looked back and this will be called the Trump era, because Trump was a really, really important president, I think, actually, believe it or not. I know it seems kind of weird, but he's done quite a bit to realign the entire Republican party Many of the kind of the rich, stuffy, white elitists in the Republican Party have left the party and gone and become Democrats. Meanwhile, a lot of the working class have kind of come into the uh, Republican Party. Um, and so it, under, under Tom, Donald Trump. So it's kind of an interesting realignment. And I think the two of those, these two guys actually have quite a bit in common. They both scare the heck out of the elitists and the powerful, and they're despised, both of them, by the elite, by the people who have the establishments, by the people who are in banking. They're just despised, both Trump and Andrew Jackson. I'm not saying that they're equivalent in any other way. They're both outsiders that really shake up um, the Washington establishment. Okay, um, you guys can see the screen, yes? Yes, okay. Um, for whatever reason, it doesn't have the ring around it like it normally does, so just wanna make sure you guys are, are seeing what you're supposed to be seeing. Uh, three major, events in Andrew Jackson's presidency, and there are other things that are really important as well. You need to be familiar though with all three of these. First, he kills the National Bank, which once again was an attack on the elite. Uh, does anybody remember the name of the guy who was in charge of the National Bank at the time, whom Andrew Jackson absolutely despised? Calhoun. Calhoun was his vice president. But don't worry, we'll talk about Calhoun in a minute. A man who brings a whole new level of class to ugly. Um, ugly with a neckbeard. Got the neckbeard going. I'm telling you, the guy is just scary. Like, uh, you know, perhaps you've seen, you know, like Frankenstein's monster for Halloween. I would get a John C. Calhoun mask. That'd scare anyone. Uh, anyway, so uh, the guy's name was Nicholas Biddle, kind of a powerful guy, and he actually bragged about being more powerful than the president. Well, Andrew Jackson killed the bank um, by basically um, stopping the depositing of the federal government's money into the national bank and instead started putting it in these other little banks and kind of spreading it around, basically draining over time the funds of the national bank. And then finally, the national, all the branches of the national bank collapses. And then shortly after he leaves office, the final branch, I think, collapses in about 1841. 
And so that's one goal, and that'll be a problem later. Another goal that Andrew Jackson has is to keep the union together. So we're skipping down to the nullification crisis. Do you guys remember, how many of you remember from your reading in chapter 11 about the nullification crisis? Okay, this is something you need to know. So if you don't know it, don't remember it, then you need to go back and figure it out. So in the nullification crisis, uh, the um, Whiggish party had raised the tariff and they'd raised the tariff pretty high, so high, and by the way, um, the tariff is good for what area of the country and bad for what area of the country at the time? Uh, let me back up. What's a tariff? Someone tell me what a tariff is. Like tax. It's a tax on what? Goods. On goods from where? Okay, let me tell you, if you don't know this, you need to know this. What is a tariff? A tariff is a tax on imported goods. So if England is trying to sell us something, right, it's coming from England, um, and they're going to sell it for a price, the government taxes that. And what does that do for Americans? Why would Americans like to have, well, or maybe I should say what Americans would like to have a tariff on, uh, say, English goods? It was good for the Northeast because they were manufacturers. So American made goods were cheaper than British made goods. Yeah, this is exactly right. So if you think about it uh, in terms of, and, and this is still generally true, right? Um, right now, it doesn't look like anybody's going to dethrone Amazon. Amazon was pretty early. Um, in the late 90s, Amazon started, or maybe it was 2000. Amazon begins. And, um, you know, it will be really hard for another uh, online um, sales company to give Amazon a run for its money because Amazon's got it all figured out already. Uh, England was a little bit faster in manufacturing than we were. And so it was kind of hard for American manufacturers who were starting up after the English manufacturing to compete, right? And if you can't compete with the English goods, which are cheaper, what's going to happen to your American business? It's going to go out, right? You have to make money in order for, or at least you have to break even for your business to keep going. And so you, you pass a tariff on the incoming goods to raise the price of those incoming goods so that the American product can now compete, maybe even be cheaper than the English good. Does that make sense? Okay, not if that makes sense. Okay. Um, and so that's why tariffs would be, would, would be put on um, products. Now, in the United States at the time, what area of the country would like high tariffs and what area would, and by the way, um, when you do put on a tariff, that does raise the price of goods, right? So now English goods cost more and, and American goods can compete. And so if you're not a manufacturing area, it actually hurts you. So what area would be helped by these high tariffs and what area of the United States would be hurt by these high tariffs? The Northeast likes it and the South kind of hates it. Yeah, so the industrial area is going to be in the North and the South, uh, depending on where you are in the South, either kind of hates it or very, very much hates it. In fact, South Carolina hated it so incredibly badly that they threatened to actually, well, first they were going to nullify that federal tariff in South Carolina. So yeah, we're not doing that. Which, by the way, uh, challenges the authority of the federal government. And then they begin to talk about, does anyone remember? Secession. Yeah, South Carolina was like, well, and if, if we don't get things our way, we're just gonna leave the union. How do you think Andrew Jackson is going to, uh, to like that? So South Carolina, there are rumblings of uh, either nullifying federal law, which is kind of question, no, it's more than questionable, um, or, leaving the union altogether. Andrew Jackson is furious at this and his own vice president, John C. Calhoun, is also from the great state of South Carolina. And he is all in favor of, you know, basically uh, a, a secession. So Andrew Jackson is really angry about the whole thing. 
And uh, this is where he gets kind of uh, Andrew Jackson-esque. When you challenge Andrew Jackson to a duel, chances are he will shoot you and kill you. That's just his nature. Well, here South Carolina has sort of challenged the Jackson administration to a duel. And Jackson is not going to back down at all. He, he said, and I quote, um, there was a, a South Carolinian congressman that came to come visit him. And he, and he says this, he says, you tell the people of your state that if you keep on with this uh, treasonous conduct, I will come down to your state and I will hang the first man that I can lay my hand upon, upon the first tree that I can reach. Andrew Jackson style. Right, he's just going to march in there and start hanging people. And by the way, he's done that before. Remember when he went into Florida and started hanging the Spanish people? Like, he could very well do that. I mean, it might be hyperbole. It might be just Andrew Jackson being himself. And South Carolina still was not showing any signs of backing down. So the Congress and Jackson passed the force bill, which allowed Jackson to raise an army and basically march into South Carolina and shoot the whole place up, which he was very happy to do. And so what does South Carolina do? They realize that this course of action, seceding from the Union and even nullifying the, the tariff, is probably not wise. You know, a lot of people could die. And so they back down from that and say, hey, if you lower the tariff just a little bit, we'll stop all this stuff. And that's exactly what happens. And so the nullification crisis is averted. The Union is saved. Uh, but this could have led very quickly into a civil war. The civil war is put off. Oh, by the way, Andrew Jackson was very, very frightening to people. How frightening do you think Abraham Lincoln was to people when he first got elected? Firstly, no one's ever heard of Abraham Lincoln. Everyone had heard of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was a war hero who was in charge of America's most obvious um, uh, uh, military victory on the battlefield, right? Uh, plus, he has a good history of shooting people and hanging them. Abraham Lincoln looks like an oaf. You guys might say, what? That's not true. Yeah, look at him. He's got these big ears, this huge old nose, warts all over his face. He was so ugly, in fact, that one little girl wrote him a letter after he had been elected president and said, you got to grow a beard to cover that up, and, and he did. Um, yeah, he's not a scary character, and so uh, South Carolina is going to be the first one to leave the Union in uh, 1860 as well. In December of 1860, they leave the Union, and they're not worried this time because they, they're going to be dealing with an Abraham Lincoln. Well, it turns out Abraham Lincoln is far sharper and far more um, uh, of a uh, uh, apt and um, intelligent sort of a leader than anyone had expected. But that's on down the line. Back to Andrew Jackson, the Union is saved, the nullification crisis put aside. And now let's talk about the Indian removal crisis. Um, many of you, or perhaps some of you, have seen Westerns. How are the Indians portrayed in especially old Westerns? When I say old Westerns, I don't mean from the 90s, I mean from like the 40s. How are Indians portrayed? They're vilified. They are, they're vilified. And they're all, you know, cowboys are the good guys and Indians are the bad guys. That's just kind of how it was in American culture at the time, right? Um, and so I, I think this story here will, will challenge assumptions that you may or may not have about Indians. So the Cherokee had, a, uh, had an area in Georgia where they had lived for a long time and they'd lived uh, carrying on their culture. And um, Georgia decided that they wanted the land and wanted to kick the Indians off of it. And so they went through to kick the Indians off of it. Now, keep in mind here that the Indians had no place really to go. Like, and so what do the Indians do? Do they light a big fire, paint their faces, take up a war party, start, start uh, howling and pulling out their scalping knives? Is that what they do? Don't they file a lawsuit? <laughs> yes, yes. Not only do they not run around scalping white people, but they file a lawsuit in court. And it goes clear to the Supreme Court. And how does the Supreme Court rule? They pretty much were like, we can't really, you know, say anything about this because you guys aren't American citizens. So, well, sort of. Um, and there is some of that. But what ultimately what they they, they say is that um, that Georgia doesn't have a right to push the people off the, the land. 
Georgia, Georgia does not have that right. The Georgia was going to do it anyway. Uh, does anyone remember who the, uh, the Supreme Court Chief Justice was at the time? It's a name you need to know, Supreme Court Chief Justice. He was put on there by John Adams back in the 1700s. Actually, no, it was 1800. It was, it was exactly that year, 1800. This guy becomes a Supreme Court Chief Justice. He's still on there during Jackson's administration. What's his name? No? You should probably write his name down. It's in, he's a really important guy in American history. His name is John Marshall. Okay, you heard of John Marshall? So John Marshall, really important guy in US history. Um, I believe he was the second Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. And his rulings tended to favor federal power rather than the rights of the states. Makes sense because he was appointed by a federalist and he was a federalist. Now, Andrew Jackson is the first president here that's truly kind of an extreme Jeffersonian, right? This guy is actually gonna kill the bank. I mean, not just let it die, but actively work to kill the bank, Andrew Jackson is. And so John Marshall and Andrew Jackson are already at odds. It's reported that after um, in the, uh, the, the Supreme Court case, Worcester versus Georgia, that Andrew Jackson said, well, John Marshall has made his ruling, right? But how much power does a, does a uh, Supreme Court have? You got nine little old men on the Supreme Court. Obviously today there's women and it's a little bit different, but at that time you had nine little old men. How much power did they really have? See, the Supreme Court only has power because, in our, because we say it does as the people. Now, the president, does the president actually have force behind him if he wants? Yeah, it's called what? It's called the military, right? The president has force if he wants. But the Supreme Court only has force or only has authority if we, the people, agree that it does. And what does Andrew Jackson say? He says, well, John Marshall has made his ruling. Now let John Marshall try to enforce it. Which basically means what? He's Georgia's going to do to the Indians Georgia. what Georgia's going to do, right? And so Andrew Jackson comes up with a different plan to kind of, uh, uh, he, he viewed it as sort of a middle of the road plan. Now today he's completely trashed for it. At the time, though, I think for most Americans, it made some degree of sense. Of course, I, you know, I, I think it, it, in the end, it was not good for the Indians at all. I mean, it was a, it was a bad move for the Indians. And the, the, uh, the actual carrying out of Jackson's plan was also devastating for the Indians. That's where we get what, what the, the moving out of the Indians is called. What do we call that today? It's called the Trail of Tears. Trail of tears. It's called the Trail of, T Trail of Tears because the way in which the Indians were moved out was really inhumane and many Indians died along the, the trail, moving from Georgia all the way to a land that Jackson promised that they could have uh, forever. And what's that land? The Great American Desert, which is not really. Yeah, well, it was, it was Oklahoma. Oh, by the way, today, uh, are there only Indians in Oklahoma? Don't worry, Jackson's promise that they could have the land forever only lasted for about 30 years when, uh, when the land was opened up for white settlement and the Indians were kicked out. Don't worry, we're going to eventually move them out to Arizona, the very bottom there where there's just desert and like literally uh, the, the most, the, the only thing that you can grow there is like cactus. Yeah, don't worry, that's eventually what we'll give the Indians, but don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, Jackson tries to come up with sort of this, this moderate, more moderate plan than Georgia. Rather than just kicking the Indians out, he offers them a choice. One, you can basically become white. You can adopt the white religion, you can become Christian, you can adopt the ways of farmers, and you can integrate into the society in which that case, you can keep some of your land, right? You can stay. Or if you wanna maintain your Indian culture, uh, we're gonna give you land out in, uh, out in Oklahoma, uh, and you can have it forever. So those are your two choices. Uh, you do not have the choice to stay in Georgia and maintain your Indian ways. Um, and so thus we have the Trail of Tears and what happened later of course was absolutely abysmal as well. Uh, and this will lead of course to Indian Wars on, on down the line. 
But those three major things occurred during Andrew Jackson's administration. Okay, moving on. Martin Van Buren was Andrew Jackson's uh, Secretary of State and then Vice President after John C. Calhoun getting mad at Andrew Jackson over the whole nullification thing, resigns as Vice President and runs back uh, and becomes a Senator from South Carolina. Kind of interesting. When Andrew Jackson was an old man, they asked him if he had any uh, regrets in life. And he said he had only two. He hadn't beaten the racehorse Heaney's Mariah. And the other one was that he had not hung John C. Calhoun, uh, who, of course, was his vice president and then later caused him a headache. So, yeah, Andrew Jackson, kind of an animal. Martin Van Buren replaces Andrew Jackson and is Andrew Jackson's uh, pick to be the next president. However, um, because of a variety of different things, when we start moving into a more capitalistic, market-oriented economy, the, the market does become more volatile, right? Um, you have investments and then you have crashes in, in investments. And there is a panic uh, which follows the depression, or which follows, the depression follows the panic of 1837. And because Andrew Jackson had done a pretty epic job of destroying the bank, the federal government didn't really have um, very many financial tools to try to deal with the depression. And because of that, it left Martin Van Buren in a position where he couldn't do that much to deal with the depression that followed the panic. And this tended to make him unpopular. Oh, by the way, whether it's right or wrong, whenever a president is in office, when something bad happens, they tend to get blamed for it. When something good happens, they tend to get praised for it. Uh, a good example would be Herbert Hoover, who was president when the Great Depression started. His policies were actually a lot better than his predecessors. His predecessors are the ones to blame, as well as the end of World War I uh, in, in, um, in Europe, uh, for the cause of the Great Depression. We'll get into all that later. Um, but Herbert Hoover gets blamed, and he is absolutely destroyed in his reelection chances in 1932. Franklin Roosevelt creams him. Uh, another good example, I think, would be um, Donald Trump. Last year at this time, I mentioned to my uh, AP US history class that the economy and the way that things were going was the best that I had ever seen in my entire life. Our economy a year ago was absolutely roaring. Um, the stock market was high. People who had jobs even on the lower end were making more money than they ever had before. This included, by the way, minorities, and um, other people who tend to have a harder time getting uh, those jobs, even those lower paying jobs. Look, things were going great. We were basically uh, energy independent for the first time since the 1950s. This weakened the power of the Middle East, which has allowed Donald Trump to go in there and make all sorts of uh, peace deals um, because those people over there that, that sell oil, they didn't have the power that they once did because we weren't buying their oil anymore. And there's a, a bunch of other, I mean, that's not just one piece of it. A lot of other factors in there as well. Like things were going really well. And I said, things are going so good right now to my AP students that kind of almost think that Murphy's law is going to kick in and something bad's going to happen. Two months later, we all got COVID. And Donald Trump lost re-election, it looks like anyway. He got blamed for it. As Jane Fonda, the actress, pointed out, COVID has been a great gift for the left and the Democratic Party. Donald Trump was heading right for re-election, and that stopped because he got blamed for COVID. Okay, uh, same sort of thing here with Martin Van Buren. Guys, for the first time ever, a, a party other than the Democratic Republican Party or the Democrat Party gets elected since John Adams, my gosh. Okay. We're going to call this the new Federalist Party. Out of the ashes of the Federalist Party, with the advent of Andrew Jackson emerging on the scene, the Whig Party uh, shows up. In 1832, it runs Henry Clay. He loses to Andrew Jackson. Um, and they run again in, in 1836, and they lose to Andrew or to Martin Van Buren. And then finally, they pick someone other than Henry Clay to run for, for president. The Whigs do. They pick an old war hero who was victorious back in the War of 1812 in his battle of Tippecanoe. And his nickname was Tippecanoe. 
And so they came up with like a, a theme song, like the Hunter's Cabin or some darn thing, and, and a, a slogan, a Tippy Canoe and Tyler Two for president. So Harrison uh, for the ticket for president, uh, Tyler for vice president, and um, he, he was elected. Now at the time, he was considered to be absolutely ancient, the oldest president we'd ever had at this point. Uh, today, I mean, it'd be like tack on at least 10 years. So imagine a guy today winning the presidency at like 78 years old and how crazy, oh. Oh. Anyway, um, he was 68 years old when he took the oath of office. He gave a two hour, hour inaugural address in the rain about a month later, after getting a cold, a sickness, he, sorry, I shouldn't laugh. He died of pneumonia. Yep, and that was the end of Dippy Canoe. But that means we still have almost four years of Tyler too. So let's talk now a little bit about Tyler. What does William Henry Harrison accomplish as president? Well, he got pneumonia and died. Other than that, nothing. Um, now keep in mind here that the, that the Federalist ideas, like the pro-nationalist, the, the Whiggish party is finally in power. After 40 years, right, there hasn't been like a full-on Federalist type character in the office of the president. He finally gets in there and then he dies a month later. Don't worry, we have the vice president. You might be saying we have a vice president, that's why we have a vice president. But here's the problem when you pick somebody for vice president purely because you want to get votes, not because they're actually good. Um, especially when you have a really, gosh dang, now that I say that, I just, it worries me even more. I don't, just don't think about it for today. Think about it only in terms of history, only in terms of history. Don't worry about it. That's, you know, don't think about uh, sleepy anybody or anything. Just focus on this. Uh, so they picked a guy who was only on the ticket because they wanted to get votes from the South. He was a Southerner, he was a Virginian, he was a Whig technically, but he was very pro states rights and had a lot of democratic ideas. And so uh, he's gonna become president and he's gonna be hated by both parties completely. Imagine if, if Donald Trump all of a sudden became like, like a Democrat, all right? Supposing you know, Donald Trump uh, became like a Democrat and he started doing all these democratic things. Do you think that people on CNN would be like, I know we love you. What do you think? Do you think Whoopi Goldberg would be like, God bless Donald Trump for basically becoming a Democrat? No, these people would hate Donald Trump with the same venom they've always hated him with. And people in Donald Trump's old party would also begin to hate him. And that's exactly what happens with John Tyler. He was a Whig, but he vetoed his party's entire agenda, right? For the first time ever, the Whigs have the presidency. They have the Congress. And then he vetoes it. Like, and so he was a very unpopular guy. People, the Democrats hated him because he was not a Democrat. And the Whigs hated him because he really wasn't much of a Whig either. So there you have it. We'll come back and talk about John Tyler because one thing that he starts working on in his administration is significant. Other than him basically shutting down the Whig agenda, there's not much to know. That and the fact that the guy was a very, very prolific gentleman. When I say prolific, I mean he had children, lots of them, 15 of them, prolific. Um, and the reason I bring, this is not something you have to know, this is not really relevant other than the fact it's just really funny and weird and interesting. So at 63 years old, he became a father for the 15th time. <laughs> so, so, I mean, don't, yeah, like didn't quite make it to the high school graduation short sort of a deal. Uh, and then that kid had a son when he was 75. 75 years old, he became a father. Prolific family up into their old age, and they must have liked young, younger women because uh, clearly these women were all having kids with them. Um, in fact, uh, there's a, the famous love story of John Tyler and this, uh, this woman who he really liked, and she was much younger. So John Tyler was president, and she was much younger. She was in her 20s, and he uh, wanted to marry her. 
And um, she was like, no, I'm not interested, not interested. And then all of a sudden uh, they were dedicating a, a, a ship or something and, and the cannon blew up and uh, John Tyler rescued this girl's dad and saved his life. And, um, and then she made she fall in love with him. And so she's the one who gives birth to, uh, to his. He also became a Confederate, by the way, later. He was still alive when the Civil War started and he joined the Confederacy with the state of Virginia. So anyway, there you go. Uh, so that grandson is still alive. Yes, John Tyler, I believe was our 10th president. His grandson is still alive. I'm not thinking about like his great, great grandson. No, his actual grandson. Like you have a grandpa? This guy's grandpa was John Tyler. How's that from just totally crazy? Like, isn't that nuts? Um, so anyway, there you go. John Tyler uh, didn't do much for the, uh, for the country, but he did a lot when it comes to uh, having children. Okay, and then of course, we've got lots of technologies that we're going to, going to uh, focus on and talk about next time. All right, guys, are there any questions or thoughts or comments about Andrew Jackson, uh, Harrison, Tippy Canoe, Tyler Two. Oh, I should also point out, so this isn't the only grandson that's still alive of his. He actually has two grandsons that are still alive. Um, they're both in their 80s. So Did one of them die? Did one of them die? I thought one of them died like a couple months ago or something like that. Oh, no. I have to look that up. Because um, last, last time I looked it up, they were both still alive, but that was last year. Um, although I ran across an article uh, about this guy um, about a, a week ago, and I kind of glanced at it. I'm like, okay, so he's still still alive. But um, anyway, okay, well, apparently only one of them still alive. And then once they both die, it won't be as interesting. So, okay. All right, guys, uh, be ready for Chapter 12 and watch the video. Um, that I have assigned on Google Classroom. And other than that, uh, have a good rest of your day.